really says a lot in this, uh, in this time that we're in, Passover, this whole Passover season, as we've been getting everything prepared for Passover. We've been talking about it for a while, and you know, as you start to prepare for things, you ever start looking when something's far off, and you're like, oh, i got plenty of time, and, and as it starts getting closer, oh yeah, that's coming up, and now it's like just a few days away, and you're like, oh my gosh, really? Has that ever happened to anybody else? Yeah, don't be bashful, right? Right? There's a lot of stuff involved with preparing for things, and that's just part of the lesson in and of itself, is the Father teaches us if you prepare for the times that he has set, then there's a blessing that comes out of that. If you prepare in the six days for the seventh day, if you prepare in the six days to do, do your business, do everything you need to do, so that in the seventh day when the time comes, you can just focus on him. You can enjoy that time with him. Instead of sitting here going, okay, today's the day I meet with the Most High because he said to put it on my calendar. And we go, okay, I got to go meet with him today and I'm going to go spend time with him and it's going to be a great day. I'm going to rejoice in this day. Oh, I got to, I got, well, hey, I can't make it because I got to go do this and I got to go do whatever and all this other. That's why God says, in the six days, do what you got to do. Because the seventh day, I want to meet with you. It's a time that he's got set apart for us. And so, in this time, the Sabbath before Passover is called Shabbat HaGadol, the great Sabbath. And so, uh, here we are, we're entering into the Sabbath before Passover. And so, I want to share some things with you historically about this time frame. Now, I don't want to keep you guys really late tonight, because I really have just one main point that I want to make, because we've been talking a lot about Passover and just different aspects of it for the past few weeks, because I wanted you to be prepared for it when it comes. But I want to show you some things that are historically accurate. Listen to me. What are they? Historically accurate. And, uh, and, and you can find proof for this and, and to back it up. And, and you know, Josephus, all the other historians, and everybody else. But I want to show you some things. And my one main point for tonight is this. Three. Three. That's it. So I have one point and 37 subsections. <laughs> Seriously, though, you know, you, you guys are used to like, you know, on, on a Sabbath, you get like 50 or more scriptures. I don't have that many for you tonight, okay? But I, I want to show you some things. I've got some scripture for you. I've got some stuff to kind of show, to back up and to, and to, to so you can see what I'm, what I'm showing you. But at the same time, some of you know this, some of you may not, and just let me kind of put it out there. This theologically rocks the boat. But it's worth looking at. Because God's word is true. Amen? Amen? So tonight we're going to learn how to count to... Shalosh. <laughs> right? Aleph, right? Aleph, Bet, Gimel, three, right? Echat, Stein, Shalosh. We're going to learn how to count to three. You guys ready? What's this? One. What's this? Two. What's this? Good job. And about half of you got it. I can't believe it. <laughs> See, the kids are excited, you know? Come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here, man. I'm going <laughs> to I want to talk to these guys. <laughs> so, are you ready for this? Amen. Something simple yet profound, something truth but contradictory, something evident but rocks the boat. What is it? 3. 3. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The Sabbath before Passover is called Shabbat Hagadol. Hagadol is the great Sabbath, okay? Tradition says, now listen to me. I don't have a problem with tradition as long as you know that's what it is. You following me? Tradition never, and I mean by never, I mean never trumps scripture. But is there anything wrong with tradition? No, not necessarily. A lot of times there's a lot of truth to be learned in it, right? Okay, take it for what it is. Kind of like, I only quote the rabbis when they agree with me. <laughs> right? All right. 
So tradition says that in the year that Israel came out of Egypt, the 10th of Nisan was a Shabbat, and that the 14th of Nisan was a Wednesday. What in the world does that have to do with Passover? Um, hello? <laughs> when they came out of Egypt, what was that? Passover. Okay? So this is in the time of Passover. So it, it's, it's recorded, it's speculated, it's thought, it's, tr- it's down here that it says that in the year that they came out of Egypt, the 10th of Nisan was a Shabbat, and that the 14th of Nisan was a Wednesday. So listen to this. On the Shabbat before Pesach, all Israel received final instruction and exhortation before Passover approaches. It's called the Great Shabbat because it is the last Sabbath before the time that we honor the redemption that the Father gave us. Final instructions, so to speak. Okay? Last minute things. You guys got questions? Tonight's the night to ask about them. You know? These are the things that, that we, we try to focus on. Because you got time between now and Monday to t- take care of the leaven and to get rid of all this stuff. Right? So now is like the final instructions of this, okay? Again, the word we're looking here at is what? Say it with me. Tradition, right? Right? Richard, you got to do it for me, man. Come on, stand up. (laughs) Yeah, all right. And so I said, if I was like rich, man. (laughs) Thanks, Richard. (laughs) If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay? So tradition says that in the year that they came out, the 10th of Nisan was a Shabbat, and that the day that they, and that the 14th of Nisan was a Wednesday. Okay? That is important to notice, okay? Because tradition says this is what we're looking at. Is it true? Well, let me kind of put this out there. All, and by all I mean, you want to take a guess? All of the spring Moedim, the festivals, all of the spring Moedim are prophetic in that they point to the work of the Messiah. They all prophesy of the redemption he would bring. They all prophesy of of him being the first fruits, of living an unleavened lifestyle. They all prophesy of these things that the Messiah would do, even down to Shavuot, equipping them by his spirit, giving them his word, setting them apart, and and teaching them to be a people for his presence. And all of these things are prophetic, okay? So if all of these things are fulfilled in him, then can we find relevance in this time? Yes, yes. Because if it is a shadow of things to come, then it, we can kind of see how it happens the same way. Right? Okay. Would there be any relevance to it at all? I would think so. Because it prophesies of something greater. It prophesies of another great redemption that would come. What is that? It's Yeshua. And, what, and the work that he did when he came. Right? Right? What about this? What happens? Biblically, what happens on the 10th of Nisan? Well, go back to Exodus chapter 12. It says, speak to the assembly of Israel and say, on the 10th day of this month, each man is to do what? Take a lamb or a kid for his family, one per household. Now, we've covered this before. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this right now because we've already covered it. But it says one per household, not one per son. And that the idea, the emphasis, is that the Father is saying that He is redeeming His people, His house. Okay, Because we know that, biblically speaking, when you talk about a house, you can be talking about a structure, but more often you're talking about what is in the house. His people. Right? So, what happens? They select the lambs. And then what happens? You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it at dusk. The way this reads is between the evenings. Now, how do you go between the evenings? Well, it's very simple. As one day is ending and the next day is approaching. It's that time right in between, what we would call late afternoon evening. It's that right in between spot. Okay, so as one time is ending, the other time is is beginning. Okay, is there anything else? Are you ready? I got, he's ready. You ready? All right, all right. So, John 12, 1. Six days before Passover, how many days? 
Six days before Passover, Yeshua came to Bethania, where Eleazar lived, the man Yeshua had raised from the dead, Lazarus, right? His name, Hebrew name is Eleazar. So John 12, 12 through 15, verse 12 says, what's this day? So the next day would be how many days before Passover? You're good at math, man. Okay, because six days before Passover, then the next day is five days. That, what day would that make it? Five days before Passover, that is the 10th of Nisan. That is the day the lambs were selected. That is the day that they would all go and they would, they would choose the lambs that they had. If they didn't have any lambs of themselves, where would they go to select the lamb? The market or the temple. Right? They would go and they would, they would select the lambs that would have to be done. So there would be a lot of people, you know, kind of checking for this. Because, well, it's a Sabbath. They wouldn't be there. I'm sorry. Everything in regards to the high holy days take precedence over a weekly Sabbath. Even the matter of Brit Malah, the circumcision for the eighth day. No, I mean, that's work, right? No, because even if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, they would be circumcised on the eighth day. It didn't matter what day it was. Okay, because that's what God said to do. It was an issue of covenant. That was important. Okay? So this is it. So the, the large crowd, now look at this. There was a large crowd that had come what? Festival. Which festival, bro? Passover. <laughs> Passover. Right? Large crowd came for, for Passover. They heard that Yeshua was on his way to Jerusalem. They were already there. Why were they there? Needed to select the lambs, right? So this is where they were, verse 13. So they took palm branches. They went out to meet him, shouting, Deliver us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai, the king of Israel. That's Psalm 118, 26, right? Then he says, After finding a donkey colt, Yeshua mounted it, just as the Tanakh says, Daughter of Zion, don't be afraid. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. I want to show, show this to you because this is a fulfillment of Scripture. We see that in Isaiah 40, 40 verse 9. You who bring good news to Zion, get yourself up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, cry at the top of your voice. Don't be afraid to shout out loud. Say to the cities of, of Judah, here is your God, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice with all your heart, daughter of Zion. Shout out loud, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous. He is victorious. Yet he is humble. humble. And he is riding on a donkey. Yes, on a lowly donkey's colt. So when Yeshua came into the city, what was he on? And the people shouted what? Hoshiana. See, you know, it's like, no, they shouted Hosanna. Okay, the Hebrew is Hoshiana. Transliterated into another language, into English, we would say Hosanna. Okay, the Hebrew is Hoshiana. What is Hoshia? Save. What's na? Now, save us now, Hoshiana. And so they're crying out for him to, to say, why would they be doing that? There had to be one thing. They were selecting him as the lamb. Hoshiana, he was the Messiah. They were recognizing him for who he is. Save us. Why? Because the, only the Messiah can, can save us. Only the Messiah can redeem us. Only he can, can bring peace to Jerusalem. That's true. Only he can save. Only he can redeem. Only he can take us out of where we're at. He is what we are waiting for. He is what we are longing for. Hoshiana! Save now. We need you, not tomorrow, now! As they're crying, they're shouting out, and they're, they're laying down the, the branches. Look at this. Psalm 118, 25 and 26 says, Please, Adonai, save us. Please, Adonai, rescue us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai, and we will bless you from the house of Adonai. And that's what they did. This is what they cried out. And where were they? In Jerusalem, hanging out by the temple. They selected him as the lamb who was worthy. Because remember, when they selected the lambs, what were they looking for? Just any lamb will do? They had to look for a lamb without blemish, a lamb without spot, a lamb without wrinkles. <laughs> they had to look for a good lamb. And they chose him as a lamb. 
Before the crucifixion, there was more than one witness that inspected him and said that he was without sin, that he was without. There is nothing wrong with him. He is blameless. Pilate inspected him in Matthew 27, Herod in Luke 23, Annas in John 18, and Caiaphas in Matthew 26. And they all came to the same conclusion. What's your beef with this guy? <laughs> they all came to the same conclusion. That then that's, what is wrong? He didn't do anything. Why are you trying to kill this guy? He didn't do anything to you. And... and We've inspected him. He hasn't done anything wrong. And he was inspected and checked and declared blameless. Look at this. And then the lamb was slain. Exodus 12, verse 6. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. As the next evening, not night, evening, I'll explain this in a second, as the next evening was approaching, the lamb was slain. This would be in the afternoon as evening was approaching, but before it arrived, roughly around three. This word, between the evenings, the word for between the evenings is Erev, for evening is Erev. What it means is a mixture. Erev, it means it's a mixture where light is mixing with dark. And the darkness is about to overtake the light. And yeah, that's where we get the word Arab. It's Arab, it's evening. Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. The 14th of Nisan is a what? Wednesday. So from noon till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the, all the land was covered with what? At about three, Yeshua uttered a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shvaktani, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? On hearing this, some of the bystanders said he's calling for Elijah. Right? Do you remember that? Verse 48. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, soaked it in vinegar, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. Other, uh, other verses that talk about this specifically say, but he did not drink it. It says they gave it to him to drink. They put it up to his mouth, but it says he didn't drink it. It says they put it up to his mouth. Why would he not drink it? Because he made a vow when he was with his disciples. He said, I will not again partake of this fruit of the vine till I partake it with you in the kingdom. He made a vow that would be akin to a Nazarite vow that he would abstain from the grape, the blood of the grape, the skin of the grape, the juice of the grape, the leaves of the grape, the stem of the grape, in all its forms until... He partook it with you in the kingdom. And so when they gave it to him to drink, he wouldn't drink it because he made a vow. Okay? Again, just one of those little things that if you're looking for, you'll see his faithfulness and you'll see his desire to, to be there with us. Even at this expense, he could have drank it. There would have been nothing wrong with that. But he didn't because he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drink it with you. I'm going to partake of it with you. So then the rest said, wait, let's see if Eliyahu, Elijah, comes and rescues him. But Yeshua again, crying out loud, a loud voice, yielded up a spirit. So towards evening, there came a wealthy man from Ramatayim named Yosef, who himself was a Talmud, a disciple of Yeshua. He approached Pilate and asked for Yeshua's body, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen sheet, laid it in his own tomb, which he had recently had cut out of the rock. After rolling a large stone in front of the entrance of the tomb, he went away. Now, Matthew 27, 57 to 60 says, again, Yeshua was in the grave before when? Before nightfall. If you haven't caught on what I'm saying yet, yes, I am saying Yeshua was crucified on Wednesday. Not on Friday. Why? Let me ask a very plain question. How do you get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday? You can't. Not even in new math. Yeah, Common Core don't teach that. You can't, you can't get it. You would have to try to manipulate the Scriptures in order to do so or manipulate their understanding. 
If Yeshua fulfilled all the festivals and he is the fulfillment of all the festivals, then he fulfilled the festivals. Look. He was in the grave before nightfall on Wednesday. You read the time frame. You read when it was there, and when he was on the cross and when he died, and at the time frame that was when everything went black and he gave up his spirit. You just read it. Do the math. Look, Deuteronomy 21, 22. If someone had committed a capital crime and was put to death, then hung on a tree. Does this sound familiar? His body is not to remain all night on the tree. You must bury him the same day. Because a person who has been hanged has been cursed by God so that you will not defile your land, which I don't know God is giving you to inherit. This is why he had to be in the grave before dark. Because even though in his death he was still the Messiah. And even in that, he couldn't defile himself by not keeping his word. He had to keep his word. And so there were others to see to it that they did that on his behalf. And you can read it. He was in the grave before nightfall. Right? And at that time would have been right before nightfall. Right at that time. Matthew 28. Now look at this. I'll show you this very intently. <laughs> what does this say? After Shabbat, as the next day was dawning, Miriam of Magdala and the other Miriam went to see the grave. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake for an angel of Adonai had come down from heaven, rolled away the stone, and sat on it. You ready to see some stuff? I want to show you this phrase in the end of the Sabbath. Remember, after the Sabbath, okay? In the end of the Sabbath, I'll show you this phrase. The Greek, the Greek, for in the end of, means, what is this? Late in the day. Like after the close of the day. At even, evening, in the end, in the end of the day. Okay? So in the end of the Sabbath, that's as the Sabbath, in, at the end of the Sabbath, what's this? As it began to dawn. So when we say dawn, we think sunrise. It's not that word. The word there for dawn is not sunrise. How's that for rocking the boat? Look at this. In the end of the Sabbath, what does in the end of the Sabbath mean? Back here. So, late in the day. As it began to dawn, what? What does that mean as it began to dawn? Greek, epiphosko, means to begin to grow light or begin to dawn or specifically means, what's this? To draw on. It doesn't mean specifically daybreak. It means approach. As the day is drawing on, as the day is approaching. Kind of changes it a little bit, doesn't it? Look, dawn or daybreak. The word that's used for daybreak, proi, the word that's used for daybreak, I mean, this is dawn, daybreak, early in the morning. That's not the word that's used in the Scripture. The word that's used is not daybreak. The word that's used means to draw on or to approach as it is coming near. You follow me? So he says, at the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn for the first day of the week, or very simply put, as the first day was approaching, Here's another thing where when you think of things biblically, it kind of changes the mindset of how we look at it just in our normal everyday, in our modern day society. Because even the reckoning of time biblically is different. Because, see, we think midnight to midnight, right? You know, at midnight, it's the next day. Biblically, it's not that way. Okay? Look, 
as they, as they come on, they approach there, they get to the grave, and what does it say? He is not here because what? Uh, he, what's this? Has been raised. Just as he said. Come look at the place where he lay. They did not say, you just missed him. True? It's not what it says. He said, he has been raised. It doesn't say exactly what time frame he has been raised. It just says, he's not here, he has been raised. You still with me? Let me show you a calendar. Because it might help. (laughs) All right? Biblically speaking, what comes first? Evening comes first. Well, that doesn't make sense. It's because we're not thinking biblically. <laughs> evening comes first. In all reckoning of Scripture, much like the biblical calendar, the, the reckoning for the biblical calendar starts in the month of Aviv, starts in the months of Nisan. Okay? For the civil reckoning of time, they start around Yom Teruah. But for the biblical reckoning of time, in other words, as you read the Bible, and it says in the first month, third month, seventh month, whatever it is, they, where is month one? Aviv, Nisan, which is always in the time of spring. Okay? So why is it evening comes first in the scripture? Very simple. Genesis 1.5. God called the light day, and the darkness he called what? Night. night. So the rest of this says, so there was what? Evening, and there was morning. One day. It does not say first day. It says one day. God is giving the parameters for what qualifies as a day. Evening comes first, then morning. So if we're counting biblical time, we start where? Evening. So explain the days, okay? Ready? See, I got my charts and everything for you. You ready? Let's do this. On the 10th of Nisan, Yeshua entered Jerusalem. This was a Shabbat. On the 14th, he was crucified, Wednesday afternoon. And he was in the tomb before nightfall on Wednesday. So when and how long was he in the grave? What do you say? Matthew 12, 40. Just as who? Jonah was what? What's this say? Three days and... Three nights in the belly of the, of the, of the sea monster and in the, in the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the depths of the earth. Again, Jonah 1.17. Adam and I prepared a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, three nights. So he was in the three days, three nights. So in order to get this sign that Yeshua said he was going to give, we have to count three and three, right? Okay. So... Wednesday, during the day, here's the 10th, during the day, right here, as a, at, at, as, this is Shabbat, as the day is growing dark, we are entering into day one. Day one is what we would call Saturday night, because the evening comes first. So, if he is here in the day, that's one day, right? So, we start off, he was crucified here, and he was in the grave before when? Before nightfall. So, come nightfall, that's what? That's one night, and then the next day, the 15th, that's one day. So, so far we have one night and one day. Okay, so here we have the second night, and we have this here, that's the second day. So, so far we have two nights, two days. It's hard, right? Okay, so here we have, what's this? Three nights, and then down here is another day. So that's three nights and three days, which means... He would have rose from the grave 
right as this day finished and right as this day, according to the Scripture says, was approaching. Which would have been right at sundown, Saturday night. Which would qualify that he rose on the first day, Saturday night. Furthermore, the festival of first fruits, we'll go cover this a little more next week, but for the festival of first fruits, because we all agreed that Yeshua fulfills all the festivals, right? For the festival of first fruits, the very first of all the offering that's given to the Father for the field, for the field everything that's there, they take the barley sheaf, and in the temple they go and they wave the barley sheaf in the presence of the Lord on the first day after the Sabbath, after Passover. In other words, when Yeshua rose from the grave, right at that time, he was calling himself the first fruit for all of his people. He fulfilled that first fruit right there, right at that spot. He even beat the priest to it. (laughs) Because if if he accepted the priest first, then Yeshua would have been like, oh man, I just missed it. Yeshua offered himself as the first fruit, and he was received. And we say if the first fruit is holy, then the entire crop is holy. And he is received as the first fruit, the firstborn among you guys, which makes you holy. Look at this, Matthew 28 again. So in the end, or at the closing of the Sabbath, as it began to draw on toward the first day of the week. What day is that? There's only one day that it can be. Saturday night, approaching Sunday. So, this is when it happened. Behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone of the door and sat upon it. Again, prophesying of another day to come. Look at, look at Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and here's the key, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The day? What day is he referring to? Not just any day, not just a day, but the day. Look, as you see the day approaching. Again, the word for day means a time space between dawn and dark. That's the definition. So what's that sound like? What have we just been talking about? The time space between dawn and dark. And it's also related to judgment. Or the judgment day itself. When Yeshua rose, what did he do? It says that by the, by the act of raising, he went into the heavenly place that was not made with, with man's hands and he placed his own blood to make atonement for you. And when he rose, he proved he had the power to do that. So as you see the day approaching, approaching means to draw near. As you see that day approaching, don't forsake gathering yourselves together even as that day is approaching. Romans eleven twenty six. And that is in this way that all Israel will be saved. As the Tanakh says, out of Zion will come the Redeemer. He will turn away ungodliness from Yaakov. And this will be my covenant with them when I will what? Take away their sins. We've been talking about this because atonement is, the word atonement is kafar. And it literally means to cover, for safety, for protection, to cover. But even all amount of covering could not remove what was there. It was just a covering and a protection. But Yeshua could not only atone and cover, he could also remove it. He's the only one who can. Isaiah 59, 19 to 21. So in the west they will fear the name of Adonai, and likewise in the east his glory. For he will come like a pent-up stream, impelled by the spirit of Adonai. Then a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Yaakov who turn from rebellion, says Adonai. He's that redeemer that will come. And I, I think we can all agree that when they came, and they, they, the angel said, you missed him, 
he has risen, that was a declaration of saying that he's burst forth into the earth. He has done exactly what he said he would do. And why did he do it? He did it for you, but he also did it as a fulfillment of everything that was prophesied about him. All the festivals, all the feasts, pa- uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. All of these, he was, he was declaring one more time who he is and saying, you have a right to partake in these things. By being received that way, he made a way for you to be received that way. Is that important? Yeah, it is. It is. Verse 21. As for me, says Adonai, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who rests on you and my words which I put in your mouth. What does it say? Will not depart from your mouth or the mouth of your children or the mouth of your children's children now or until the Messiah comes. What's it say? Forever. The word that God gave his people That's why it's so important. You see so many places in the scripture where it says, and you shall teach it to your children so that it will rest in them and so that it'll be in their heart so that they can walk in it and so that they can teach it to their children and so that they can teach it to their children. And continual, perpetual, and ongoing and everlasting. Amen? That's how we need to approach that. Just very simple. Three days, three nights. In the grand scheme of things, the importance of it is that just he was crucified, died, buried, and resurrected. But again, just some things to show you. It's a, it's a, it's a matter of look at the Scripture. Look at the Word. <laughs> You might as well just give up, Paul. (laughs) That kid runs circles around you, man. (laughs) In his defense, that kid is fast. (laughs) Jose's laughing. At least he's not talking about me, right? That's what we need to know. But I think it's important that we learn to understand that we need to look at Scripture in its biblical context. The way that it was written, the way that it was prophesied about, the way that it was given, and the way that we should receive it is as the Father said. And I think we can learn a lot if we just approach it that way. Because... The last time I checked, God said that he doesn't change. And the scripture testifies of Yeshua that he is the same yesterday, today, and (laughs) forever. And Yeshua said his word won't go away, not even until heaven and earth goes away. The last time I checked, still there. He said the covenant he made with Israel won't go away and even the sun, moon, and stars and testify as a witness to that fact. They're still there. I think it's important that we learn to approach the word the way that he gave it and to learn to see things in regards to his word. You know, we often get accused of following man's traditions. You guys ever hear that? Because we do Passover. Oh, you're doing man's traditions. The last time I checked, God's the one that gave that. I think it was man's tradition that said, don't do it. Sabbath? God said, it's a means to honor him. Man said, if you keep the Sabbath, we'll kill you. What traditions are we keeping? Who's following man's traditions? That's why I said it's important that we need to see Scripture the way it was given, in the context that was given. 
And if we could learn to see in a true first century perspective, I mean by Yeshua and his disciples, the way that it was taught and given right there, we'll see that it's continual in the very way that it was given from the beginning. And God never changed it, but we've done a lot of harm to it. I think it's time that we need to go back and take a look at the Word and let the Word say what it says instead of trying to explain it and excuse it. Amen?